for being back here on the stage. Um, thanks, Sophia, and your team for um, inviting me here again. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to get a gauge of how many people here are not from the screen-based industries, but are actually artists or, con you know, in, in, other, in other sort of cultural sectors. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. So, basically, today's um, uh, talk is really around positioning, it seems it's, it's a lot more kind of like heady and sophisticated, that title, in <laughs> Immersive Intersections. Um, but really, it's all about the fact that we're now at a stage in VR where we can't actually help but have to collaborate with each other. That's kind of like if there's a cut line to my talk, it's about the fact that um, VR is at this particular juncture where if you're not collaborating with other people, then it's going to be a big problem. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. So before we begin, um, I had to kind of explain, well, why does she get a, why, why does she think this? What's, what's sort of her background that allows her to kind of um, um, uh, position this juncture of VR in this manner? Well, we've been running sort of a, a digital entertainment accelerator as part of the Canadian Film Centre called Idea Boost for quite some time over the past six years. And being the only digital entertainment accelerator in Canada, um, we've had to really sort of uh, choose which technologies to invest in. And VR, MR, AR, or immersive media in particular, is a core um, sort of investment space for us. But instead of just being a traditional accelerator, what we really wanted to do was to be an innovation sort of space where we would have a set of activities that would create this virtuous cycle of innovation, which includes, yes, traditional accelerator-like activities, which is investing in startups and companies, and that's our core um, sort of idea boost uh, activities that we do. But we also think we should eat our own dog food, so we produce works, um, and we produce works with a variety of partners, and our mandate regarding uh, VR production is really to constantly push the form and to try not to do the same thing over and over again so we can really understand where that particular medium is going and also which technology startups um, are important in pushing that particular medium forward. We also run capacity building labs, again with a variety of partners, and this is to really look at, um, in a more theoretical and also practical manner, what the medium is all about, how to make it, what are the considerations we should be thinking about, etc. And then uh, we need to kind of uh, also look at the realistic uh, logistical parts of this entire um, sector and look at how it's actually being shaped as an ecosystem. So we do industrial-based research. So all of these activities um, have led us to, well, have led me really to understand the value of this notion of intersecting between either multiple sectors or media or disciplines or practices or people, etc. So this is the, the, the context from which I'm giving this talk. And I think the first thing we need to establish is just we need to talk about numbers first, okay? Especially since many of you here, it seems, may not be VR pr practitioners. So we need to sort of put a pin on it and say, well, what's happening in the VR industry today? So the first thing to note is that it is in the early stages of development. So it's not like, so I would say that v people thought that VR would be sort of hitting the, uh, I don't quite know what the accurate number is, but the billion mark sometime in 2016, that the, the party would arrive in 2016, well, it didn't quite arrive, but I think it's not to say that the sector doesn't have legs, it's just that we probably overhyped it, and this is a much more realistic picture about where things are going to go. And if you look at this graph, you know, it's really not until probably uh, 2025 that we're going to see um, VR really take off. So we're looking at a two to five year cycle in terms of when VR will hit complete mainstream adoption, or at least mainstream adoption of the ilk that the iPhone probably had when it first um, came out within its first uh, five years of being put into the market, right? And 
you can really see it once you start to look at uh, what are the actual, how many headsets there are in the hands of people. And so if you look at the different kinds of platforms that we've got from the Samsung gear um, all the way to you know, the latest one, which is the Sony VR, the, the big things to note are the fact that the premium headsets are, have actually only sold um, less than 500,000 units. So that's the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. And there was this bump with the Sony VR PlayStation when they, when they reported having sold 915,000 units, and that sort of made everyone really quite excited, but still the numbers aren't holding up. And, the, and that five million of um, units that Samsung Gear allegedly reports um, is, is seen by many people as like, uh, not, well, not that they think that they're lying or anything like that, but that it's, it's not, not, and not everyone is clear that that's actually the real number. <laughs> This, I did not, that's not, do not repeat what I said, Mr. Video Camera. <laughs> um, but the, really the interesting thing to note is this number by Sony, the Sony VR PlayStation. And the fact, and, and the other interesting thing to note, which is sort of my addition to this graph, is I just very quickly calculated what are the potential, you know, the potential members of the community that would have primary access to the, that particular platform, right? So if you look at the Sony PlayStation, there's 50 million PS4 users. So the fact that 915 of these headsets has been sold means that there's an upside to upselling into that community. And then if you look at obviously the mobile, the mobile phone community, there's, a, there's quite a bit there, although it's a little bit more difficult because the mobile phone is used for many purposes, while as um, at least we know with the Sony VR PlayStation, it's typically for entertainment purposes, so you can imagine that there's the conversion rate for people who have these um, large-scale platforms, um, would, you could imagine them converting to buy a head-mounted display. Okay, everyone get where I'm at? Okay, so then um, the other thing to understand is this notion of how much money is actually being poured into the industry. And in terms of VR, VC investment, it's still quite high, but if you look at the graphs, a lot of those investments are in Magic Leap, which is an AR platform, and they're, and they're kind of, they're, they're um, collapsed into a single kind of um, thing with AR and VR, so it's a little bit uh, misleading, although the number is still, is still fairly high. But we see the VC investments softening somewhat in VR and getting much stronger in AR. So we are seeing that particular trend. Um, but the, but so it's not, for me though, it's not so much how much money is being invested in VR, but who is investing in VR? Because for the first time, what we have are traditional entertainment companies actually making investments in a technology platform. So you've got you know, Time Warner, Comcast Ventures, et cetera, and, and not only are they investing in the platform, they're investing in content studios. So Felix and Paul is a content studio with a technology attached to it. Um, Jaunt was similar, et cetera. So, um, so it's, it, it really, <laughs> this, the, the rise of this particular anomalous behavior among VCs to actually invest in content gave people like myself, who's been in the investment space for some time, quite a pause because, you know, as coming from the content arena, we've had to kind of, um, we've had to really double down on our technology acceleration because no one was investing in content. And then VR came along and then all of a sudden they started investing in content. So we had to run quite fast to start to accelerate companies that were both content companies and tech companies at the same time. So that's quite interesting. The other thing to uh, look at is how, um, as I said, noted, you know, the VC investment has s sort of softened somewhat. So it might might have softened in VR in terms of the technology, uh, more b people being more interested in AR, 
but also uh, the softening is around entertainment itself. And what you're seeing is um, some investments moving into uh, enterprise applications. So Andreessen Horowitz, which is you know, one of these blue chip VC firms, um, invested in a social productivity app um, which was, uh, which was, I think, just about six months ago, and um, that was a, a thing that everyone marked in the valley, which was, oh, Andreessen Horowitz is now in, oh, but they're investing in, not in entertainment, but they're investing in productivity, okay? And then last, this is a, this was, um, I think, an, uh, uh, a, <laughs> a graph taken from Greenlight Essentials Virtual Reality Industry Report, Spring 2017, and uh, this was, I think, screen grabbed by uh, CampaignAsia.com. I don't have the report, so I was lucky enough to find this screen grab <laughs> um, through CampaignAsia.com. But what's really interesting he here is where revenues are going to migrate from now and what they're predicting in 2021, okay? And so the dark green are the head-mounted displays. So uh, this year, there's, you know, 65% um, is being spent on that, or, 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 or there's revenues of that. It's gonna go down to 58. But look at the yellow, which is enterprise-related applications. Um, it's going, it went up from 1.3 to 24.2. And then if you look at consumer content, it went down from 11.9 to 8.4. Now, these are just projections, but it's interesting to note sort of the trends of well, how people are projecting certain trends in the industry. So given this kind of uh, sets of current reality, okay, how do we as a cultural sector then try to start to understand what to do with VR and how to really move in this space over the next little while? And that's where I think we really need to think and work across boundaries, okay? So I'm gonna talk about three very specific ways in which we can think and work across boundaries. Um, some of them are specific case studies, some of them are notional, and then I'm gonna also then look at um, uh, what I think we should also think about, which is how do we design with some intentionality in mind as well. So the first thing I wanna talk about is something that actually everyone here in Australia knows very, very well, is um, really good at, has the right policy infrastructure to take advantage of, even including new kind of grants and things that are happening. And this is really to think about VR as part of a cross-platform play. And the reason for this is, uh, is for many of you who know about cross-platform, like the reason why cross-platform became a thing to begin with was that we couldn't fund digital content. <laughs> And so we thought what we do, and I'm saying we because Canada had the same sort of policy framework as did Australia and, and France, et cetera. What we did was we said, okay, if we're going to incite a whole bunch of creatives to start to think differently about digital networked digi the digital networked medium, we need them to start um, investing in and learning about how to build interactive media product. And so the way we're gonna do that is to tie um, uh, funds to television broadcast shows, and if they have a broadcast license, they can then extend that, et cetera. So the, the, the kind of capacity of many Australian producers and Canadian producers to understand how to make cross-platform productions work is relatively high compared to all of the other jurisdictions out there. And given the fact that VR is still going to take some time before it really hits its stride, I think we might have to employ the same type of thinking around how to think about making VR, okay? And this is a really, really great example of that. So the Polar Sea was made by Primitive Entertainment, which is a television show. I'll just play this behind me and you can watch it. Um, which is a, a television uh, a studio um, about the Polar Sea. And they worked with Deep Inc. Um, 
helmed by Thomas Wallner, um, to create a 360 and to create the extension pieces. And the extension pieces became 360 video, um, an app, maybe some of the kind of like uh, uh, stuff around um, the, 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 the kind of uh, learning content, et cetera. And this is all pre-Oculus Rift DK1. When this whole thing launched, they realized, oh, well, we just built something out of Unity and um, we can actually just port it over to a VR kind of experience. And sure enough, they did that. And so if you can see, they don't even have the proper Google Cardboard at that time. They created their own because it, it literally came out exactly almost at the same time that the DK1 did. But what happened was um, this was a very, very successful um, type of uh, VR experience for many reasons. One, because it was eminently monetizable, or at least financeable, okay? So they found financing to do this project because it was attached to a number of things. Um, but more importantly, um, the company that made this actually ended up having to develop a series of technologies to make the kind of transition from flat screen linear um, experience to 360 experience work that they ended up creating an end-to-end -end solution, um, platform solution for cinematic VR. Um, how many of you have heard of li Liquid Cinema? Okay, do you use it? Not yet, okay. So Liquid Cinema was born out of Deep Ink, and um, so Thomas goes around, and, and it's one of the companies that we're actually accelerating right now in our, in our accelerator. He goes around, he was just at NAB, and he talks about the, the software that he, he, he has developed and the platform. He's, he was an award-winning um, documentary filmmaker and also interactive documentary maker who then has transitioned into becoming a full-time startup founder in order to really focus on the development of this end-to-end -end cinematic VR solution. And so um, what, the, what the particular solution does is it allows uh, you to uh, have a forced perspective view on cinematic VR. So for those of you who know about VR, uh, when, you're, when you're working with cinematic VR, I should say, uh, the, one of the core issues is that the, the user or your audience member can look anywhere in an environment. And so sometimes when you make a cut, that particular audience member may not be looking at a place you want them to be looking. And so whatever cut it is that you made that's meant to convey um, uh, you know, um, action of the story moving forward or something gets lost. So what this end-to-end -end solution does, what Liquid Cinema does, is no matter where anyone is looking, um, when that cut is made, that cut, th that viewer sees that cut. So that's what they're calling the forced perspective authoring feature. Another feature that they have is um, uh, decoupling vector graphics um, from the actual uh, cinematic plane. Um, so as many of you know, again, if you've got subtitles or if you've got um, supers, so in, especially in documentary, and you're looking around, um, you could be looking at something and then you don't realize that that person uh, is actually uh, the, the professor that you, excuse me, that you should know about. So in this case, um, the vectors, the vector graphics, which could be titles, which could be subtitles, which could be localization content or anything like that, can be imposed on the area of the cinematic plane depending on where you're looking. So um, that actually saves a lot of time for many people. And then uh, last but not least, and certainly not least, um, once you author your cinematic VR, you can then publish to multiple headsets, headsets all at the same time through their player. And so, in fact, what's happened is um, Arte uses them, uh, ZKM, a whole variety of um, uh, European broadcasters are now using the Liquid Cinema platform. And um, where they're at right now is they're trying to turn this end-to-end -end, um, cinematic VR solution into a software as a service, so it's a SaaS play, so that anyone can kind of um, go to their uh, site and pay, kind of like Adobe Creative Suite, pay $5 a month all the way up to $300 a month depending on the features that you're using, and then actually enable a whole ecosystem of players from the very small ind indie producers to the large broadcasters to create cinematic VR 
with the very features that we want in cinematic VR. So this is an example of uh, thinking out across the boundaries in two ways. One is obviously looking at VR as a part of a whole, uh, a whole kind of um, smorgasbord of other media types, right? And then it's also looking at the VR practice that you have potentially as more than just content creation, but also as technology development, which you, you may be able to monetize, or at least someone can see can be monetized for you. So this is something that I think we, we may want to think about, okay? So, 2B. <laughs> What's another way for us to think and, and work across boundaries? Well, one of my favorite um, exhibitions of all time, I would have to say, um, was a particular exhibition in 2008 at the Hayward Gallery in London called Psycho Buildings. And so they worked with a variety of internationally renowned artists to come up with these fantastical um, spatial expressions or fantastical spaces in which people obviously don't normally uh, see, let alone live in. So this is one of my faves. Uh, this is the top of the Hayward building. You could actually get on. So this is real. This is not photoshopped or anything. You could actually get on a, a rowboat. It's an Austrian collective called Gelatin who did this. Um, get on a rowboat, row in on this, on this uh, ceiling and um, check out the view, et cetera. It's, it's super fun. Um, another one is by a Korean artist uh, who uses silk to create these um, rooms. And uh, so they feel like they're definitely, uh, a, you know, a, um, that, that they, th they hold um, matter. And yet they're so, it's obviously made out of silk. So they're, they're fragile and you can't, you can't, I mean, there's no way you can even touch it. You touch it, the whole thing sort of starts to sway. But when you just see it in a still manner, you can kind of see it as almost materialized as a, as a concrete sort of space, right? Um, and then uh, Los Carpinteros uh, showroom is, a, is the name because everything that's in that space came from Ikea except for the bricks or maybe the bricks did, but they, they wanted to reconstruct and explode these rooms and everything is actually hanging by um, you know, uh, fishing lines. And so you've, you're in that space and you've, you're at that moment when something has exploded. So, you know, and, and, I, and I got reminded by this particular exhibition because just last week or two weeks ago, um, I happened to be in LA and um, I went to the downtown LA in Lincoln Heights and there was a 150,000 square foot installation called the 14th Factory, okay, made by Simon Birch and um, 18 other Hong Kong based artists. And they took this 150,000 square feet of downtown LA space and they converted it into rooms and rooms of installations from video art installations to recreations of comets, which when you turned the corner had the um, fully recreated room from 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, and of course, we very quickly went in there and captured it um, in VR. And, uh, and essentially what, but that wasn't, I mean, that was the fun part, but what was the more important part actually was that when we saw that space, we thought, you know, next week is VRLA, which is arguably the largest, um, one of the largest gatherings of VR practitioners in, in Los Angeles and in that area. And so what we wanted to do was to invite people who are VR, are VR creators and technologists to come together with contemporary artists in this 14th factory and have an, a conversation. Because we think that there's a whole slew of artistic practices that could easily inform how we create VR. Film is only one of them. Theater, we talk a lot about, you know, punch drunk love gets, gets um, sort of bandied about in every single VR conference that I've ever attended. Um, this is immersive theater, right? Um, but I think there's other practices like just pure contemporary art, et cetera, that we need to start to think about because of the way they understand, the, the, these particular artists understand space and because VR, in essence, is a spatial medium. 
And because in many ways, a lot of what they end up uh, exploring are new ways of understanding um, uh, our environments, right? Recreations of environments that are either fantastical or reflect um, dynamism in stasis or et cetera, you know, like what Los Car Carbateros did. And, and I'm not sure whether VR today, because of the emphasis on either cinematic VR, so capturing the real in a kind of literal way, or gaming um, is really yet a site for contemporary art. And I think, again, this is one of those things where um, while we're waiting for VR to really take in the next two to five years, um, actually seeing it as an artistic medium and as an artistic space to do contemporary art could be something that's super exciting. And that's not, uh, this is not something new, because for many of you who were part of the web revolution, I don't know if you remember, but in the early 90s or late 90s, early 2000s, everyone was all gung-ho about interactive TV or the possibility of um, CD-ROMs, DVD-ROMs, and that those were all sort of more or less commercial media. Um, and then the web came and everything slowed down again and things got really difficult to make and you know, e-commerce kind of took off and there, there was very few um, ways in which to actually create entertainment properties solely for the web that many people ended up moving into interactive um, art. And uh, there was uh, kind of this explosion of interactive art and technology um, when the large museums started to invest in um, developing interactive art installations and interactive curated ex exhibitions. And I think what we're seeing now is potentially the beginning of that, but within the VR space, where there's actually a potential for VR to be financed and um, where all sorts of experiments and productions can happen in VR as purely an artistic space and practice area. And where I think that's happening the most right now is in web VR. And um, I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, uh, net, art, net artists, so people who can code, um, can easily start to migrate some of the things that they've been doing in net art into web VR stuff. So this is just an independent coder slash artist who's been trying to recreate a whole bunch of different environments in web VR. Google obviously is trying to push for web VR spaces. If you look at even just the images, so if you, if you, if you take sort of cinematic VR, Google image search, and you do web VR, Google image search, you start to see that they're exploring completely different kinds of spaces. So when you look at this, you don't think of this as VR necessarily. So I think there's a lot more um, freedom potentially in the web VR community to really play around with what um, a 360 uh, explorable space could mean, all right? And for our purposes, for, for us, it's not just about um, the kind of web VR space as, or this metaverse, if you will, as a space for contemporary um, art exploration, but it's also potentially a space that we can colonize, that the, that the colonized can colonize themselves. So uh, we've been working with the Institute of Indigenous Futures, um, Jason Lewis and Scawanani Fragnetti out at Concordia University, and one of the things were, so we did this, um, this uh, first experiment about two to three years ago at Hot Docs, where we took Skawanetti's um, um, aboriginally determined um, territories in Second Life, okay? So she created uh, what she felt were indigenous future spaces in Second Life. And then we hacked Second Life at that time because it didn't have a, um, a, a plug-in to, to, the, to the VR headset. And we 
uh, we hosted these live guided tours of these uh, newly created indigenous uh, spaces in Second Life that she and her students created and, wa and walked people through them. So that particular practice was, uh, that particular experiment um, ended up uh, being very successful that we're now looking at as part of Canada's 150 potentially um, hosting one of the largest sort of social uh, hangouts in these newly created indigenous spaces in Second Life in VR. So I think there's a lot of kind of interesting things we can do as we start to um, move beyond what we think uh, the traditional VR environment is supposed to be. So that's one sort of thing to think about. And then the last thing is to really start to work uh, across uh, sort of the other side of, um, of, of arts and culture into science. Um, and this is, uh, this is actually, I've had, you know, you guys can see it, I brought it here. Um, so this is a, a project that we did with the Art Gallery of Ontario um, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Rijksmuseum. Um, and these objects that you see in, his, in this person's hand are what are called Gothic prayer beads. They're from the 15th century. They're made out of boxwood. And um, inside uh, these beads are uh, essentially Christian um, iconography and stories. In this one, uh, which is part of the Thompson collection, it's the Last Judgment and the Coronation of the Virgin. Um, and they wanted, these three major art institutions wanted to assemble for the first time the largest collection of Gothic beads. And, um, uh, but they didn't want to just do kind of like an ex exploration of these, uh, uh, sort of an exposition of these beads. They actually wanted it to be also about how did these beads get made, et cetera. And so they wanted it to be, to be a forensic exhibition that shows people who may have been making these beads, where, how, et cetera. And so in order for them to do that, they, the conservator at the AGO, Lisa Ellis, um, employed a whole host of um, uh, technologies to try to kind of un uh, understand these beads. And she finally landed on the micro CT scan. That's at the Met Cloisters where we have this show. Hang on, I'm just going to keep moving forward. So yeah, so she finally landed on the micro CT scans. And so she scanned these beads at the um, University of Western Ontario, worked with Dr. Andrew Wesley there. Um, his scan typically scanned mummies. Um, so she, so her gothic boxwood beads were the first sort of objects that this scanner scanned. Um, she then worked with a, a software uh, 3D modeling reconstruction company in Montreal who allowed her through, because now that she knew where the seams were and the scans, she could then re recreate these models together and um, started to really unpack how these um, particular beads were made. And then the next step became, well, how can we go inside them? Because the moment you look at these beads, you say, I really want to go inside the bead, not just look at it. And furthermore, when we typically look at these beads, they're behind the glass box. So she came to us and said, I really want to see whether we could do this in VR. So we took the scans of these beads. We then developed a whole set of new shaders. We privileged the actual scan and did not want to sort of tamper with the quality of the scan. So we, try, we kept the scans at the highest possible resolution. So there's 10 million polygons that we're working with um, in this VR experience. And, um, and then, so what we were able to do was to create it in the Vive and allow you, and the, and the creator and artist who did this is Priam Javord. So he, he allowed you to actually move inside this bead and explore it and really understand um, how the artist, well, the artistry, the, the, fa the facility of the sculptor to make such faces, to create, you know, to create the hairstyles. In fact, there's a, there's a man, which I can show you later, um, that has a wide-brimmed hat um, whose face has been revealed 500 years after the, act, the, the sculptor has, um, has sculpted him. So uh, you could actually go like that in the VR and see that he has a face, which is phenomenal, considering that in the bead, there's no way you could see that man's face. So um, 
so this, this whole kind of experience really led me to think that, again, you know, we are doing ourselves a, dis as a, a disservice as creators if we don't, you know, jump over that line and work with other people. Because there's a, the, the boundaries that, that this enabled us to do was to, to really move across the boundary of the material, right? So it, 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 we're working in virtual reality, but it is so real. <laughs> it's, it's not about recreating reality, it's actually about working with the material culture of the scan, which I find quite fascinating. And, um, and that's something that I think, you know, everyone a, as creators, as people in the space, uh, should think very deeply about in terms of how do we actually uh, open ourselves up to working with all of these other domains um, with expertise that we don't have so that we can actually do that kind of full exploration. So that's the last thing that I want to talk about. Before I continue, I just want to make sure, what's my time? Is ping around, um, two minutes, two minutes, okay, great. So design with intention, this is for transformations. Uh, so VR is gonna take two to five years, right, to s resolve, so we need to start thinking about, well, how are we gonna finance our productions, who should we be working with, how can we explore, et cetera. But, just as important, I think, is to not just kind of sit on our laurels and not think that we don't have an opportunity to actually um, really try to move the industry in a particular way so that uh, by the time it is part of the mainstream, that it, it, it hasn't sort of gelled in, in a manner that we, we didn't have any control over. And what I mean by that is that, you know, the first thing is I think we have to start thinking about virtual reality um, as more than just about recreating uh, the physical space, but about um, uh, sort of unearthing the hidden realities of the human condition, right? And there are lots of artists that have talked about this in the past, Char Davies being one of them, who really uh, thought that VR allowed us to explore the subconscious and things that we can't actually um, look at uh, uh, head on in the physical realm. Um, the second thing that I think we need to start really thinking about is not just the social dimension of the media, which we know is going to move into that space, uh, with Oculus, Rift being owned by Facebook, et cetera, but maybe it's about really figuring out how we design it as cooperative media. So, and cooperative media can mean many different things, one of which is that we link payment to consumption. We don't want to be stuck with a VR universe where um, you know, we pay for everything by giving away our da data. We already know that's gonna happen, so how do we start creating cooperative media platforms in VR as part of that infrastructure now so that we don't end up uh, in the same place we're at on the web today? And you just have to look at things like Patreon, which is a platform for um, you know, supporting the arts, et cetera, and other types of co cooperative media platforms as a potential um, set of examples on how we might do this. Um, I think we need to think about not just the technology infrastructure of B VR and how we build that out in terms of our companies, but the ethical frameworks associated with how we build out our, our VR practices. So um, how we deal with terms and conditions, how we decide to work with subjects, how we decide to work with our collaborators, um, how, we, uh, how we frame um, all sorts of different things uh, that we're not even quite there yet because the industry hasn't quite matured. And I think it's easy to just think about the hardware, but not enough about the wetware, and the wetware in this instance is the ethical frameworks that we need to start designing today. And then last but not least, it's not just about privacy, but actually about digital human rights. So um, it's, it's clear to me that uh, we are most definitely moving into uh, a time when um, you know, the system is gonna know what we know before we know it. And you know, Yuval Noah, Noah Harari thinks that that's inevitable, perhaps, and other, other thinkers like that think that's inevitable. I'm not sure if I want that to be inevitable. So this is the new um, Building 8 uh, facility that Facebook has, which they announced during F8, 
that says that they are looking at brain interfaces that will anticipate um, uh, what the thoughts are and actually feed it to the computer before you know what the thoughts are. So this is um, uh, Professor or Duggan who is in charge of that. So we know that this is happening and I think we need to really think about it. And why do we need to think about it? Because even though it, VR's not lived up to its hype today, it's actually going to fast forward 10 years from now to be completely fully baked. And unless we actually uh, participate in that baking process, I don't know if you're gonna like what the fully baked version will be. That's it. <laughs>